I love one location movies. I enjoy seeing what great directors and writers can accomplish when restricting themselves to telling a story with very few actors and tied to a single place. Cutting out all the unimportant fact, meandering plot or superfluous dialogue, and focusing it solely on what is necessary. Stories of characters being stuck in a small place with no way out or unable to trust the people around them, and seeing how the tension between them just naturally brings out their best and worst attributes. They feel like uncut cinematic plays and elongated short stories that are straight to the point, a sort of narrative minimalism. And for the filmmaker, it's a great cost-effective entry point, but behind its apparent simplicity lies a certain complexity, a challenge to make something compelling with less than most. Everything at your disposal carries a larger importance, the words you use, the space you're in, and the meaning behind them. But when pulled off exactly right, they are great examples of the tenacity and malleability of storytelling. Now, I have touched upon this a bit on a previous video about creative limits. But in this essay, I want to explore the art of the one location movie using three examples from films I really admire. The first being Alfred Hitchcock's sedentary voyeuristic thriller, Rear Window. The second is the hermetic and dialogue-heavy Twelve Angry Men. And the last one is the recent and disorienting The Father which I feel is a great movie that many people are still sleeping on, or haven't even noticed because the marketing makes it look like a forgettable dramedy. Although, maybe that was a deliberate attempt to lull you into thinking that this movie wouldn't be a devastating horror story. In any case, these movies use three things to a certain degree. Isolation, a pressure cooker atmosphere, and a mystery box. If you're a new filmmaker and are thinking about making your first short film, I believe these examples of how to do a one-location movie could be indispensable to you. Also, spoilers will follow. And today's video is kindly sponsored by Surfshark, but more on that midway. Some of the best one-location movies are able to create a great sense of isolation. In Alien, we can feel the urgency of the crew being hunted down one by one by a cosmic intruder. As they are left with no way to escape, alone on the ship, surrounded by the emptiness of space. But isolation can also be achieved by simply being stuck in an awkward dinner party, like in The Invitation, an uncomfortable get-together that begins to turn once the host politely pressures the guests into joining a cult. Apart from having a closed space scenario, you can also create isolation by taking away elements from the story. In Locke, it's by reducing all external interactions to audio phone calls. In 12 Angry Men, it's by not using flashbacks to present the past information. In Rear Window, it's by immobilizing the story's perspective. In this movie, we share in the isolation of the main character, Jeff. He's an often out-in-the-field photographer that has recently been rendered temporarily wheelchair-bound after an accident. Like him, we have no access to the outside world, only what we can watch and hear from a distance. We never get to see any other rooms in Jeff's apartment, only the rear window and the lively courtyard. On one night, he notices the increasingly suspicious actions of one of his neighbors. Alfred Hitchcock constructs a murder mystery only from a single vantage point and through a proxy. Jeff's girlfriend Lisa acts as his prime aid to his amateur sleuthing. Because the perspective is tied down, it gives a bigger emphasis to the use of sight in the movie, as shown in the beginning for shots. We start with the main character's POV on the rear window, followed by a pan and tilt of the courtyard he shares with his neighbors. This gives us a sense of texture, sound, and feel for the location. It is an extremely limited space, but purposely populated. The camera presents us to the main character, the daily routines of his neighbors, the decorations and colors informing us on who they are, the heat wave they are experiencing, explaining why the windows are open. Then back to the main character, his broken foot, his name. We get the background of his accident, his career, all this geographic and story context without a single word being uttered, only through sight. Even the source of tension is based on sight as well. Lisa, what are you doing? Don't go. Jeff's unique vantage point permits him to see what is about to happen, but he's unable to do anything to stop it. The helplessness in the situation is taken advantage of. He becomes like us, just another audience member hoping Lisa will find a way to escape. But this physical immobility is also used to parallel his personal fears. This movie is about a murder mystery, but also about his relationship with Lisa. He is allergic to staying in one place for too long and wants to keep exploring the world as a photographer. But his relationship with his girlfriend is advancing and he worries that he will be restricted by her. 
It is because he is forced to stay in one place that he is able to see the importance of Lisa. That in life, she is not someone that will tie him down, but help him see more. Isolation can be used to create atmosphere and suspense, and in Rear Window, it also serves as a chance for personal growth. What's it all about? Nobody's hurt. A one-location movie has the perfect environment to produce a pressure cooker atmosphere. As mentioned previously, putting a handful of people in a small room for a prolonged amount of time is naturally going to produce moments of dramatic tension, even without adding a supernatural angle or ticking clock scenario. One of my favorite examples of the past decade is the claustrophobic 10 Cloverfield Lane. There is a world-altering event happening outside a bunker, holding three strangers. And yet the best parts of the movie are not about the alien invasion, but the boiling tension between the survivors. That this seemingly safe place has a danger within. But the best example of this has to be in the even more succinct 12 Angry Men. 12 people of different ages, backgrounds, social classes, and personalities are put in a small room to convene unanimously on one thing. To reach a verdict beyond the shadow of a doubt of a person's innocence or guilt. Now that's a tall order. I mean, most of us can't even convene on what movie we want to watch with people we know. And here we're talking about deciding over someone's life. Unlike Rear Window that focused on the use of sight, here the means of creating tension is by the use of words. The presentation and dismantling of facts and arguments. The reason why this is a pressure cooker is because the story is designed in an unbroken moment, happening in real time. There are no jump cuts, no flashbacks, no side stories, no internal monologues. All we see in here, important or otherwise, is externalized in this room. This uncut moment maintains the tension throughout and is reinvigorated by every new argument. And yet everything starts off as somewhat polite and reasonable, as a quest for facts. But as things progress, we start learning about more than just the case. The movie takes into practice that if you want to know someone, you should let them talk. The more they say, the closer they get to what they really think. Their prepared answers disappear and their unedited side comes to light. So as they keep talking, we find out who is more open-minded, more complacent, excitable, and who are really looking for the facts, and who are letting their prejudice control their judgment. The pressure cooker is used as a narrative tool, to let it all come out to the surface. With juror number 10, it comes out in the form of bigotry, and for juror number 3, it's a personal issue. If you notice, the true character arc is shown by the main unshakable antagonist, he goes from, Here's what I think, and I have no personal feelings about this, I just want to talk about facts. Which sounds reasonable enough, to the unrestrained, You all know he's guilty, he's got to burn, you're letting him slip through our fingers. And finally, to a self-realization. Not guilty. He let his personal experience with his son color his judgment. By punishing the young defendant, he would be punishing his son. As the ever-resilient juror number 8 best put it, Wherever you run into it, prejudice always obscures the truth. The One Location movie is a perfect place for arguments to run their course, where pleasantries fade under pressure, and truth will eventually be revealed. Now, if you're worried about your online privacy not staying omitted, well, you might be interested in getting a VPN like the one we use from Surfshark. Not only does it give you access to a lot of content from streaming services that would otherwise remain geolocked in other countries, but most importantly, it protects your information by encrypting all the data that you send through the internet and where you're connecting from, and adding to that peace of mind even they don't log your information. There are a lot of VPNs out there, but we prefer using Surfshark because it's one of the fastest, well-reviewed, most affordable, and offers a slew of features. Not only does it work across all platforms, but you're not limited to the number of devices you can install it on. Use Surfshark Alert that lets you know if your information appears in a leaked database, or Surfshark Search to prevent ads or trackers to follow your searches. I could go on, but I recommend you look it up on your own. Go to surfshark.deals screened. If you use our promo code screened, you will get 83% off the regular price, which means for something like a couple of bucks a month, you can be fully protected. Plus, you'll get 3 months for free. Surfshark offers a 30-day money-back guarantee. So if you try it and you don't like it, you can simply cancel your subscription and get your money back. And now we return to the show. Where's Anne? I'm here. I just went down to do some shopping and I'm back now. 
Another interesting method to take advantage of is the ability to create a tightly knit mystery box. In the Feng, the mystery is the identity of the shapeshifter that is among the men in a remote outpost in Antarctica. In Locke, we start off with no context to where the main character is driving and why. So each phone call gives us answers, but also deepens the mystery as to why the driver is seemingly sabotaging his life. And like we saw in Rear Window, the mystery is if Jeff's neighbor is a murderer. So as you can see, there are different ways to play with this element. But one of the recent intriguing ones for me is the way it's used in The Father. The mystery box here is the way the story is told. We start off with a simple premise that the titular father, Anthony, is getting older and increasingly forgetful to the degree that he needs a caretaker. But Anthony is completely resistant to the idea and assures us that he's fine and he can live by himself in his flat. As the story progresses, we start noticing that everything is far from alright as the flat he's in keeps changing. Here the mystery is tied to the main character's perspective and how his reality is shifting. The importance of the location is even accented in the script. In every case, the space is identical. The decor is the only indication that we might be in a different place. The intended aim is to create uncertainty and the impression of being simultaneously in the same location and somewhere different. At the start, we're in Anthony's tanned colored apartment. A few scenes later, it's his daughter's more modern light blue flat. Later on, even the hospital waiting room has a striking resemblance to the previous locations. The decorations get mixed up disappearing or appearing in a puzzling manner, all this to create confusion. And this continues with the characters as well. The daughter Anne sometimes looks like the nurse Catherine that we officially meet at the end. Anthony's caretaker Laura's appearance seems to be conflated with that of his late daughter Lucy. Events are played out of order. We don't know what is the present, past or future because it's all jumbled up. In some cases, even looping scenes without noticing. It's hard to make sense of everything because that's how the main character sees his surroundings. Dementia has robbed him of his bearings. The main character starts off in a place of certainty. I'm not leaving my flat! I am not leaving my flat! To being aware of his confusion. Isn't it? Tell me, and this really is my flat. The location is a symbol of Antony's waning identity. How it's becoming increasingly unrecognizable mirroring how he's losing himself. When he ultimately reaches the nursing home, he makes a painful realization. Who exactly am I? All his bearings are gone. He is no longer sure of anything, not even his own identity. And like him, we can't tell what is true, a mystery he must live in, as it becomes a reality he can't escape. A one-location movie may seem simple at first, but it can hold so much possibility. It can force us to find personal growth, create a much needed introspection, or accept an uncomfortable reality we prefer to avoid. A realization we would not find if we were not stuck in one place. I think these days it's not too hard to imagine being stuck in one place for a prolonged amount of time. I wonder what type of stories that's going to produce. Anyway, next week we'll have a recommendation list of 10 great one-location movies you should definitely watch. But we also want your opinion. So let us know down in the comments what are your favorite selections and why. And we might feature your comment in the video. Make sure to stay notified for all our future videos. Leave a like, share with a friend, and subscribe to the channel if you haven't done so yet. The music was made by Eduardo Gonzalez. If you like what you heard, check his information down in the description. See you next week at the Screened Film Club.